Hi, I'm, I'm Sam Bogosh, uh, CEO of Axel AI, and uh, I'm here to talk about uh, collaborative video editing uh, as, a, as a general theme. Uh, I'll also be talking a little bit about what our company does specifically. Um, and then at the end of the presentation, I'll be uh, outlining how some of the major companies in the industry uh, are, are handling this question because the strategies that they're taking are, are pretty diverse. And so everyone from Adobe to Blackmagic to Avid, uh, they all have their own spin on, on how uh, collaborative workflows should go. And uh, the interesting thing is that there's a pretty good uh, collection of those and they're all slightly different. Like it's not like, it's not like you can stack up the product and say, oh, this one has two more features than that one, but more like they're, they're just coming at it from very different directions. So I'll be talking a little bit about that. Now, the underlying problem here is that uh, collaborating on video is, is inherently kind of a mess. Um, there are ways to get it done. Uh, and a lot of them, of course, emerged very aggressively during COVID, like people had to figure this out as best they could with uh, you know, limited technical resources, and in many cases, uh, no experience doing more than just handing around hard drives and using Dropbox. So uh, how, that, how that all happened during COVID is an interesting kind of case study. And I'd probably like to take a little bit of time uh, talking about that and uh, both the, the good out of it and, and kind of where we've ended up. But the underlying is that you've got these huge media files with, with hard drives everywhere, right? Typically um, terabytes and sometimes even petabytes of content. You can't easily find the stuff that you want to share. And then when you do find the stuff you want to share, you've got to upload it and download it to a, typically a cloud service where someone else could go get it. Now, this could be as basic as Dropbox or as fast frame IO or, or uh, you know, uh, even even something like LucidLink, which lets you uh, do shared editing, but kind of tension between what you have on premise and what you have in the cloud, um, and and having to move things back and forth. Uh, despite the fact that this is a tricky problem, uh, there's about a half million teams worldwide and and several million editors uh, who are busy facing it every day, and probably some of the folks attending this sem seminar are among those people. And that number is expected to keep growing dramatically through the rest of the decade. So the, the industry numbers uh, that we've seen show that there'll be about a million teams by the end of the decade uh, doing exactly this kind of work. Uh, and that's because of the increasing importance of media and media workflows. Uh, you know, So much of marketing, so much of communication of any kind depends on media, everything from political campaigns to sports teams to universities and churches, um, you know, they used to all rely on maybe printed materials and, and some web designs and this and that. And now it's just video, 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 uh, often delivered uh, by social media. So that it's, it's a very strong incentive to, to solve the problem. Um, but it's, it is the hard problem. Um, these are some of our customers, uh, at Axel, uh, but it, it gives you a sense of the range of of people that are problem everything from big brands uh to to theater venues to uh broadcasters government organizations etc and um i'll just talk a little bit about how a couple of our customers have have uh have handled this kind of thing one is the national broadcaster of malaysia rtm um they have a, a big deployment of our software and they have a, a tricky problem which is they have a lot of regional offices with varying amounts of uh, high quality internet connectivity. So some have very good connectivity, some not so good. And uh, they had a completely local workflow with almost no integration between the sites uh, and ended up deploying our software to kind of coordinate across all the sites and create a common view so that you can search and manage assets uh, and edit them from anywhere in this widely distributed uh, geographic organization. Now that's more a traditional broadcaster, but, but those actually represent uh, a minority of our customers. A lot more of our customers are, are kind of like Coachella, uh, which has uh, a 20 year archive of over three petabytes of, of video content. And you see some of it there on the right, you know, stacks of, of uh, Lassi and G drive hard drives, uh, RAID towers, network attached storage. Um, 
it, it it's just all over and uh and yet very high value content you know you got beyonce red hot chili peppers you name it uh now there are rights issues they can't just go out and and uh uh start putting that on a fast channel you know they have to negotiate the distribution rights with the artists involved but um it's still a very valuable resource and they're, they're uh they're not just a an events company but they're they're also potentially uh an ip and broadcast media company the other driving force in all this uh rapid collaboration uh theme if you will is that the media creation cycle is is accelerating rapidly it used to be that if you had a project to put together uh you would have months to plan it months to shoot it months to edit it um then things started to tighten up to weeks and because of social media now it's often measured in hours it's like political campaigns in particular but also sports teams a lot of these folks they're like Hey, I've I've got a breaking story. I need some footage. I need to go live with it. We need to put it out on the Facebook page this afternoon. And so it's 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 just a totally different uh, scope of of timing for the editing work than existed uh, before before social media and before come. We we don't see it slowing down anytime soon. Now, maybe the next version of this slide will show it in minutes. You know, uh, because that's where things are headed. And that means, by the way, that you have to be able to do all this stuff. You know, FedEx is no longer an option. If someone calls you in the morning and they say they need something posted to, to uh, Facebook or Twitter that afternoon, uh, it doesn't matter how good your delivery system is, you're not going to get a copy of that hard drive sent to you uh, unless it's like by courier across town. So for the most part, you're going to need software systems. You're going to need remote access. You're going to need uh, a browser interface uh, to make this stuff work for you um and and that's where the cloud comes in and particularly the hybrid cloud um i'm a big believer in the fact that for media um, a pure cloud approach just like everything in the cloud is very expensive and less than ideal um th there are real problems with just dumping everything into the cloud first and foremost of which is that you're going to spend a lot of money that you would not spend otherwise and maybe you can afford that but even then it's in the cloud it's not where you want it which is often on some local machine so you can you've got to bring it down uh and with many of the vendors that that involves egress fees and um you know further further uh costs and technology um this is some of our team members uh it, again I, this is kind of a corporate slide but um just to give a little background on, on me for instance uh I was head of product management at Avid for five years in their work group and enterprise software. So what's now called Media Central, we actually uh, built the interplay business and then rebranded it as Media Central uh, a year before I left. And it's continued to be a, a real force in the industry, but only typically at large accounts, large broadcasters, places like NBC 30 Rock, CBS News, Fox, the BBC. That's really where Avid uh, has the most juice. And uh, in the kinds of markets that we at Axel are focusing on, uh, it's a different world. It's really uh, been dominated by Adobe to some degree. It's starting to get a little more interesting in terms of the editing suite where people are using more black magic uh, resolve because it's free. Uh, I, we've seen more Final Cut actually, partly because the M1 and M2 Max are so good. And so, you know, people are kind of recommitting to Apple. And when they do that, they're spending the extra 300 bucks on Final Cut and finding out that, you know, in the 10 years or so since they killed Final Cut 7, that they, they've they actually uh, managed to turn it around and it's a pretty cool product. So um, so we, we see more and more Final Cut and Resolve out there. But still, uh, Premiere is, uh, I would say, more than half of the market and probably 60 or 70 percent. Um, obviously from from an avid point of view or from a black magic point of view uh they don't have quite the market share that adobe does right now uh able to give their customers a really good collaborative editing experience um this this is our uh, part of the answer to the cloud uh editing collaboration challenge it's called axel edit and it's basically a browser-based media manager with an editing timeline uh, so you can go in and, uh, you know, not only manage and review clips like you could in a system like Dropbox or Frame, 
but then you can actually drag them into a timeline and edit in your browser. And what's especially cool about that is that it's collaborative so that multiple people can be editing together. Um, so you can see what other people are doing, they can see what you're doing, and you can create different versions of an, an edited sequence uh, that everyone can, uh, can work on concurrently if you want. Now that leads to the question, how do other people do this, right? This is how Axel does it. And uh, actually, we, we're very pleased to announce at NAB that Atomos, uh, the uh, uh, capture company, uh, has licensed our product and, and uh, is releasing it as Atomos Edit. So if you own you know, one of the Atomos Ninja devices or one of their other capture devices, uh, you'll be able to uh, kind of flip a software switch and upload everything to the cloud where it can be edited in this software. Um, so pretty powerful stuff. And we expect other important brands will, will have, I think, uh, a similar approach over the next few years. Um, Sam, sorry to interrupt yes. you. Uh, we have somebody asking uh, if these are proxies or full res clips. Yeah, very good question. What you see in the browser is a proxy. So these are H.264 proxy files. Um, we, we, we do some custom enhancements to make the scrubbing really fluid. Um, and, and to allow you to put them on the timeline together and, and edit, edit something up uh, in real time. Uh, then what happens is, so you're, you're previewing it off the proxies, but then when you hit render, it goes back to the high res, which, which can be 1080 or 4K there. So, so effectively, when you, when you complete the sequence uh, and render high res, but that's a great question. Any other questions before I kind of talk a little bit about uh, some of the other approaches? Uh, not that I can see yet. Okay, cool. All right, great. So let's talk about how other vendors have been addressing this type of problem. Um, uh, maybe I could start with Adobe. Obviously, their their acquisition of Frame.io last year was kind of a, a landmark in the industry because it it took them from being kind of a software supplier with downloads from the cloud into actually having a, a very powerful cloud offering. Um, now, Frame.io is great for review and approval, and they have fantastic integrations uh, with other Adobe apps. And they've also just announced the a broader uh, range of asset support, things like still NDFs, et cetera. So making it more of a dam than it was previously when it was pretty much con confined to video files. Um, that strategy, I think, is because, because they have such good market share on the editing side and, and with After Effects and Photoshop, I think a lot of people are going to continue to use Frame and, and continue to sign up for Frame. So Adobe sees it as a really big growth opportunity, and I, I think that's that's sensible. Um, and so Frame is is becoming, I'd say, along with Dropbox, one of the most common uh, platforms that people use to share and review material. Um, and so Adobe's approach to to collaborative editing is basically have multiple instances of Creative Cloud applications running on Macs and PCs, and then have Frame be kind of the the cloud glue, if you will in between those. And then with their camera to cloud initiative, they're saying you can upload directly from your camera if it's sufficiently high end. You can upload directly from your camera uh, to the cloud and then have frame to share it out uh, and then bring it down to uh, various editing systems that, that will be presumably running Premiere, but could be running other things as well. Um, so I think it's, it's, uh, a broad strategy. I think it works very well for the industry as a whole. Um, and probably the only gotcha with it is the, is the cost. Uh, because when, when you save something in Frame.io, it's not the same price as commodity cloud storage like Backblaze or Wasabi or Seagate Live Cloud. Um, instead, you're paying a real premium for having it there. And uh, so... I, I would say if you really do the math and you're, you're thinking about uploading all of your high-res material into Frame.io, you know, you better have your wallet ready because it's it's going to be expensive. Um, and for that reason, I think it's a little bit limited. Like it, it, it'll address the needs of a certain part of the market where there isn't huge amounts of footage, but we have customers that are reality TV shows, news organizations. Uh, they upload thousands of hours and 
I think it's safe to say they're not going to be doing that for all their footage, uh, nor nor should they. Uh, but it, it, you know, for meeting the needs of a big swath market, and because it comes with the horsepower, if you will, of of Adobe behind it, uh, I think it's it's obviously a leading contender and will continue to be. So so that's kind of Adobe's take on this stuff. Now let, let's talk about some of the other editing vendors, uh, in particular Black Magic and Avid, um, because they have each their own view of things and it's driven in part by what they're good at as a company so let's talk about black magic for a moment they, they've come out with their own uh, collaborative editing strategy and it involves a mix of davinci resolve which of course you know that's that's what they have for and it's it's a very powerful and uh i would say increasingly uh well thought of tool um and then they have all this great hardware for capture and ingest and even storage. So they've come out with like these nifty little network attached storage devices that run off SSD and they cost anywhere from, I don't know, reasonably configured, uh, let's say seven or $800 up to $15,000. Um, so their, their strategy is that if you want to share stuff with your colleagues, you're going to use one of these widgets for the local storage. And then for the hybrid cloud portion of it, use Dropbox. So they have a tie-in with Dropbox that synchronizes the local storage to the Dropbox uh, backend, if you will, in the cloud. And then um, all of your material gets shared and even managed uh, collectively um, from, from that platform. The gotcha is, of course, that you have to buy their hardware. Uh, so to get to really get the full benefit of this, uh, and, and that's fair. They're trying to sell more hardware. They're, they're in business to do that. Uh, they also, of course, uh, are, are, are favoring DaVinci Resolve, which at this point, as I mentioned, from a, from a market share point of view, is, is not as mainstream as Premiere. It, it's probably an up and coming number two um, with Final Cut right in there. But, uh, but you know, if you, if you were just hire 10 editors and ask them what they use, these days, seven out of 10 will say Premiere. So it, it, it's a slight drawback, but if you have a team that's really into Resolve and you have uh, a collaborative remote workflow need, uh, the Blackmagic solution is, is very well designed. Um, and you just have to buy these kind of hardware widgets to, to tie it all together, um, which also give you, by the way, shared edit at each point. So it's not like uh, it's, not like it's uh, useless without the cloud portion, but it, it really kicks in nicely when you have a hybrid cloud setup. Now, Avid has something uh, similar, uh, but a little bit more old school in that it uses their Nexus storage, what's called Nexus Pro. And uh, about two years ago, they announced something called Nexus Edge, which is the ability for the Nexus storage to stream proxies out to Avid editors and even to some degree non-Avid editors. So. If, if you're running multiple instances of Media Composer, some of them might be connected to the storage locally on the network, and some of them might be at remote locations and need the streaming functionality. And with Nexus Edge, you can do that. Um, but it, it is similar to the Blackmagic approach in that, A, it, it privileges the Avid editing environment. Like, it, it's not going to do as much for you if you're in Premiere or Resolve. And B, you have to buy their storage, which... I think the starting price is around 10000 for that. So it has a higher ticket entry point than the Blackmagic solution, but philosophically, it's it's similar. Um, the other big difference, though, is that it doesn't have a strong cloud component yet, so most of the storage is assumed to be on the Nexus Pro. They don't have that Dropbox tie-in for the synchronization the way Blackmagic does, although I assume they're working on stuff like that. Um, I, I'm I don't, I don't have any uh, privileged view of their roadmap, but I would think that that would be a, a smart thing to do next. Um, so uh, broadly speaking, I'd say Magic and Avid uh, have, have, they have their own editor and their own storage hardware. Uh, any questions so far? Uh, nothing yet. Okay, cool. Um, the next one I want to talk about, and this got hugely popular uh, during uh, COVID, is, the, for lack of a better term, like the Teradici and Parsec uh, approach of just sharing your screen. 
Uh, most of us have experience with these kinds of products. If you've used uh, a, uh, any desk or, you know, like some kind of remote desktop tool, even Apple remote desktop, where you can log into a machine from somewhere else. Um, the problem with those is that they don't have the low latency and the high bandwidth required for remote access to editing software. So if you try to run uh, Premiere remotely over any desk or team viewer, uh, it's going to be super laggy. You know, the frames are going to come up like you know, one per second or something, and the mouse is going to be laggy, and it's a terrible experience. So I would not recommend that. Um, but uh, a few companies, particularly uh, Teradici and Parsec, and among others, um, were able to solve this, basically engineer in much better bandwidth and much lower latencies uh, for uh, editing workflows. And so what a lot of post houses did during COVID and a lot of broadcast editing environments as well, people couldn't come into the office, but they had their favorite workstation and the, the workstation was still sitting there. Plus, just about everybody's got a laptop at home. So what they did was they ran the Teradici server on the workstation, most often an HP workstation, but it also uh, works you know, reasonably well on Macs. Uh, so you basically take the Teradici software, you run the head end on the workstation where the person normally sits, and then it streams that content out to their laptop at home. And uh, that turned out to be a really good solution because basically you're, you don't have to do anything different. Like with, with a lot of these cloud solutions, you've got to rethink where you're going to save things, what the user interface looks like, what you're going to do. Here, it's just like, I have everything I normally have at the office, but from home. Uh, and that turned out to be you know, pretty darn good. It also let them leverage all the shared storage that they often had accumulated over the years. Um, again, this is often in the hundreds of terabytes, and you can move all that to the cloud, but if you do, you'll be paying typically thousands of dollars a month. Whereas the on-premise hardware to store this stuff, the network attached storage is a sunk cost. They already own it. They're really just paying the electricity bills. And I will say also in the last few years, hard drives and SSDs have gotten super reliable. So it used to be like, if you set up one of these network storage devices, you know, a drive would fail every six months, but we're not seeing much of that these days. Uh, drives do fail, but you know, if you've got like, a dozen drives in your device, maybe one of them will fail every few years. So even your replacement and warranty costs are very low. And you know, you just pay the electricity to keep it on and you have hundreds of terabytes that people can share. And with these remote work approaches, um, they can not only share it if they're sitting in the office, but they can share it from home. And uh, if if one thing uh, COVID taught us, you know, if, if it taught us anything, it's that you can still get stuff done from home and that many of these uh, you know, fairly picky editing teams are realizing that their productivity might be better if they didn't, like, look at LA. If you don't have to spend an hour and a half on the 405 going to work and coming home from work, that's three hours you get back in your day. You can get a lot of editing done with those three hours. So if the user, user interface isn't quite as crisp as it was when you were sitting at your desk, hey, maybe that's worth it as a trade-off against 405. And uh, I can't tell you how many post houses have gone with this approach, um, which is a little bizarre because you visit them nowadays and there's very few people at the office, right? I mean, there's, there's a bank of the workstations, which they typically will aggregate into a room now. It's like a server room, but it's a workstation room. And they're often side by side with the actual servers and there'll be just like a row of HPs or a row of, of uh, a Mac, you know, trash cans uh, running the Teradici front end, the back end software. And then everything else is just logins from home and they buy a ton of internet bandwidth uh, to support to support the workloads that happen. So um, very interesting. And, uh, you know, I would say an elegant solution to an urgent problem that cropped up uh, during COVID. But now... It's kind of the status quo. Uh, and I think a lot of editors have grown to expect that. Like if you had an editing job, you say, well, uh, you know, this is the job description, but you have to actually come into the office every day. Uh, I think a lot of people would not take well to that. Um, now, 
The other point of view is sort of the Elon Musk point of view, which is that you guys are a bunch of wusses and you get your butts back into the office no matter what. And maybe that works for him because he's Elon Musk. But for most uh, industries, including creative industries, the fact that the talent has, has options means that they're going to prefer a hybrid work environment. They're going to prefer uh, combinations that let them work from home. So um, any questions about kind of the Teradici approach? Uh, and uh, and by the way, Teradici has been acquired by Hewlett Packard, HP, the missions, since when you buy an HP workstation, uh, which again, just drives this trend even further. No questions yet, but feel free to submit those in the Q&A section or the chat pod. Definitely. Uh, the, someone is asking, um, what is Sam's thoughts on LucidLink? That was the next one I'm coming to. So very timely question. Um, LucidLink takes a different approach from all the ones that I've talked about. Um, essentially, what they do is they're a front end for cloud storage. And uh, instead of just treating it as native cloud storage, which is you know object storage that needs to be accessed in a different way than traditional files, LucidLink puts kind of an emulation front end, uh, a device driver, if you will, that tells your laptop or desktop that what it's seeing is actually a storage drive, but it's not, it's, it's still in the cloud. And then LucidLink does a very smart job of bringing down just the material that you need uh, to get your work done. So if you open a file in an editor, it could be a multi gigabyte video file LucidLink is not going to try and download the whole thing. It's going to figure, well, he's probably going to start, you know, scrubbing from the beginning of it. So let me grab the first hundred chunks. And it goes and it grabs the chunks. And then it, it watches what you're doing in terms of which chunks, like let's say it grabs chunks one through a hundred and it, it fools your computer into thinking it's got the whole file and you keep playing. Uh, what it's doing is it's watching as you go from one to two to three to five to 10 to 20, right? It's like, oh, oh, you know, we better get more files in that direction. So then it goes and gets additional chunks. Um, and it's able to supply those chunks, especially in the, in the most recent versions of LucidLink, it's able to supply those chunks uh, quickly enough to kind of fool your, your laptop into thinking it's got the whole file. Um, now, there are some issues if you scrub around like crazy, if you hop in the footage, like you know, to random places, it's not going to react as well as if you had the whole file there on your computer. But for most uses, it is indistinguishable from having it on your local hard disk. And that'd be cool because it is shared also. Like you could be doing that and somebody could be accessing the same file also from the cloud laptop a thousand miles away. So there's all kinds of interesting possibilities that come up from this. And essentially, um, it's it's a really neat trick um and it works very well and they've, they've been very successful with it they've raised a bunch of money so they're you know they're growing quickly um the challenge for them is cost that uh, essentially when you use lucid link you're typically tri tripling the cost of the cloud storage which wasn't all that cheap to begin with so it's a great place to put your work in progress if you have several people that want to edit something in Premiere or Final Cut or Resolve, um, or even Avid, I think, uh, you, you could share it there. With Avid, you would lose some of the bin locking and stuff, so it might not be quite as good. But, but fundamentally, LucidLink is a great solution if you have a modest amount of footage that several people need to work with concurrently in different places. There's, there's no better solution on the market. Um, but if you just keep dumping stuff there, it has the same problem that Frame.io does, which is pretty soon the price tag starts to escalate. So um, think of it as, as, as kind of the place for your white hot projects, the stuff that needs immediate collaboration. And then what you're going to want to do is migrate it off of there uh, to either uh, commodity cloud storage or on-premise storage, whatever makes the most sense in your, in your world. Um, but it, it's not a magic bullet because because of the cost. Um, and maybe they'll do something to address that. But it, as I understand it, the cost isn't going up. And you know, I'm I'm kind of a bang for the buck kind of person. Like 
all of these technologies, like every single one that I've just described, could solve a huge range of problems if it was free, right? Like, I mean, if uh, let's say Black Magic just said, everybody who uses Resolve got it for free, we're going to give you our synchroni our, our Dropbox synchronizing cloud store, um, uh, NAS storage for free also. And then Dropbox said, all you guys, you know, we're going to give you free Dropbox cloud storage. If the whole thing was free, everybody would use it. The challenge is, of course, it's not free. And these are commercial vendors that need to make a living. And in some cases need to also pay back their venture capitalists, right? So, um, the and they don't pay them back like debt. They pay them back with, with an exit, as it's called, which is when you sell the company. But still, like, you're funding that with your with your uh, hard-earned dollars. So um, so that is the challenge with, with Lucidlink, I think, is keeping their pricing down to a level where people could use it more broadly because it, it makes a ton of sense uh, in applications, the real-time collaboration, but it, um, but it doesn't apply to hundreds of terabytes or even tens of terabytes of storage in most cases. We do have a, a comment and question in the chat uh, yes. It says, on using AI, I believe the editing process hitherto has been unproductive because we bring everything into the editing app. We are then essentially forested footage. What are Sam's thoughts on using ML and AI to only ingest required footage and assets? Yes. So absolutely. That, that is one of our strongest points as a company. It's why we're called Axel AI. And by the way, I did just, it was weird. Uh, the um, the little panel with, with the chat did just come up so I can start to see that now. Um, so yeah, it's a huge drag, right? Having, having hundreds or thousands of hours of footage that you have to go through uh, just to figure out what you want to work with is one of the biggest bottlenecks in the industry. Uh, we have been working to make it a solvable problem for over a decade now uh, at Axel. And I would say my work at Avid before that was along similar lines, but just for bigger customers. So um, it is key because if you, can, if you can narrow down the footage that you're going to be working on, then you can pick the right technology to, to share it, collaborate. You can put it in Lucidlink. You can put it in Atomos Edit. Like, if you know that these are the 20 clips you're working with, it's fine. But most often, there's hundreds of clips, and they're often very obscurely named, uh, you know, like 0019248.mxf. And then it's like, I think that was the one with the highlights, but I'm not sure. So with, with Axel AI, it gives you this global view of all your assets. And we're not completely unique in doing this, but, but I, I would say our emphasis is unique because we combine the functionality of, of a MAM, a media asset management system, with the interface that you're seeing here, and then the AI tools and machine learning tools to analyze those contents. So what we give you is, is four separate um, combined tools. One of them is speech transcription. One is face recognition. Another is object recognition. And finally, logo recognition. So you have all of those in your timeline, and you can very quickly get to the appropriate or relevant sections of your footage, pull that out, and, and, and then really take it to the collaborative platform of your choice. And maybe it's not even collaborative. Maybe you just need to pull it into Premiere. You know, we have a, a panel for Premiere. We have drag and drop interfaces uh, for Final Cut, for DaVinci, and for Avid. Uh, and we even have panels for After Effects and Photoshop. So, so what we're trying to do is make it really easy to narrow down the subset of your footage that, that you should be working with. Of course, you're no longer dealing with tens or hundreds of terabytes. You're dealing with a manageable amount of footage that you can then edit in, in the tools of your choice. Here's another question. Shot size recognition as well as type of camera. Okay, so oh, type of camera move like pans or zooms or things. So we don't currently have those. Uh, like you mean if it's a close up or or if it's a yeah a wide angle shot those kinds of things that is a very good point I haven't seen that done well yet but um, our our system is modular and so we will probably end up integrating those kinds of capabilities uh, or even developing them ourselves we're we're kind of a agnostic company like a lot of our stuff we develop in house but when we find something that's that's really good 
that someone else has distanced it or, or plug into it through APIs. But right now we don't have that. And I, I agree that that's, uh, that's kind of a hot area that somebody should solve. That is true. Once you've recognized an object, it shouldn't be too difficult to ascertain its size. And then you could work your way backwards to the, pan, the panning and the zooming. Absolutely. Um, very good point. The only problem is, by the way, that AI doesn't know what's in the foreground in many cases. Um, so like it'll pick up logos that are eensy weensy in the corner uh, and then, you know, tell you that that's what the scene is about. Um, now, of course, there are ways to code around that and say if the logo isn't in the middle of the frame and if it's smaller than X, then ignore it or give it a different ranking. Um, but those kinds of things have to be explicitly uh, told to AI to do. Like people will often make assumptions because they think AI works like people do, um, and uh, and it doesn't. It, it 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 just sees what it sees and and reports. Um, one of my favorite examples of that was that um, in an early version of of uh, Microsoft Video Indexer, uh, which we integrate with, by the way, so you can plug in Video Indexer. Um, there was uh, footage of a baseball game and it was doing an amazing job. And it was like home run, strikeout, you know, crowd. So it, it was it was pretty accurately describing the footage. And then it said card game. What's a card game doing in the middle of this playoff, right, game? And so, so I scrubbed over to where Microsoft Video Indexer said card game. And what it was was the manager and a couple of the players leaning over the wall of the dugout and the wall of the dugout was a green rectangle so you had three guys leaning over a green rectangle and so microsoft was like that must be a card game I've, every time i've seen three guys leaning over a green rectangle that is a card game and so it, it totally erroneous tag but you can't blame guys leaning over a green rectangle any human being could say that that was not a card game but you know Video indexer didn't know that. Hope that's helpful. I don't know. Um, let's see. Any other questions? I mean, we're. I. I, I really uh, like. It's. It's harder to do in in a web. You know, in a, in a Zoom context than it is in person. But um, thank you. Uh, but uh, you know, happy to answer questions that people may have. This is a, a, obviously a rapidly evolving space right now. I mean, between the billions of dollars that Adobe has spent on frame and a lot of the cool startups um, well, like LucidLink, for instance, and then what you know, a bunch of longer standing competitors like Blackmagic and Avid are doing, uh, it, is, it is an interesting time to be in the business. And I think in, in two or three years, you're going to see hybrid approaches that combine several of these, right? It's not going to be all of this or none of that um, a perfect example is is atomos with the atomos cloud and atomos edit that they they make devices right so they made their name with with the ninja and the other devices that clip onto your cameras and capture footage then they're like well why don't we just upload directly from there to the cloud and save people having to swap in and out ssds and hard drives so they've done that and uh and now that they can bring it up to the cloud, it's like, well, now that you've got it in the cloud, uh, why don't you edit it there? So again, they've licensed Axel Edit for that, for Atomos Edit. Uh, but I have no doubt that things like LucidLink will also play in where you could be like, okay, I've done my rough cut editing in Axel, but now I want to do craft editing. So I should be able to just push a button and send it to LucidLink. And then I should be able to jump in with, with Premiere or Resolve or Final Cut do the next steps of the end, uh, never have to leave this, this Atomos edited environment. Um, so I, I think that's what you're going to see more and more of over time. Uh, interesting comment here from Roland. I think the future belongs to the to take advantage of AI. Specifically, I'm looking at developing an AI bot that can create AI tools that are attuned to a company's production house needs. That sounds great. Um, and, you know, drop me a note. Actually, anybody who has interesting uh, thoughts on this stuff, uh, I'm happy to, uh, happy to, and I can give you my LinkedIn as well. Yeah, uh, please feel free to get in touch. Um, and that, that applies to anybody on the call. Like, uh, I'm kind of an open book, as you can tell. Um, a lot of our business is, 
collaborative and just talking to folks. You know, we, we learn as much as we uh, convey when we have conversations with customers and, uh, and also partners. I mean, if, if anybody here is a developer of AI tools like Roland, um, I mean, that's, that's really interesting. Um, and, and yeah, AI is going to totally transform the space, by the way. You've already probably seen uh, some of the wild stuff that's being done by, by like Runway ML. Um, those tool sets are going to get better and better rapidly. Uh, they, they may not be a replacement for like an entire Hollywood movie anytime soon, but you're going you're gonna to be able to generate ads, for instance. You're going to be able, able to uh, interesting snippets of footage and and over time bigger and more complex pieces and uh from from an ai perspective i think this industry could be completely different in uh three or four years like eyesable and you know some of the craft artists and the text people will be steering ai rather than doing all the work themselves so that i mean we want to know we're really excited about it actually AI. it's it's some of that potential uh you can see a collaborative tool set like axel edit or atomos edit with plugins where you could bring in um footage you know directly from a generative ai system uh and and curate rather than having to think powerful and very likely outcome of the next few years questions getting towards the end of the hour but i you know generally leave a few minutes in case uh in case there are wider discussion points have we worked with dam developers well uh mams and dams so that's that's an interesting question um mams and dams are closely related uh i used to be in the dam industry actually before i i went to work at avid and the big difference between dams and mams is that dams are more just on still images PDFs, um, you know, kind of the traditional creative tool set and less on rich media and, and video. Um, that being said, a lot of dams are starting to get MAM features. And like Frame.io or like our systems, a lot of MAMs are now able to handle still images. Oh, you're asking about MAM. Okay, well, that, that's true too. Um, so uh, a, a lot of MAMs are now able to handle still images and PDFs very well. So we ourselves are a MAM. I mean, if you look at this user interface, this is is a MAM interface. You can search it, uh, you can navigate, you can you can tag, you can use AI based meta tagging. Um, so we tend not to partner as much with other MAM vendors. But one of the things that's interesting about the MAM space is the number of MAM vendors that have been acquired in the last three years. Uh, it's it's literally dozens. So everything from Cat TV being acquired by Quantum to Levels Beyond and Kino being acquired by Signiant to uh, Diva being acquired by Front Porch, um, uh, Prime Stream by Ross, the list goes on and on. It's like every couple of months somebody gets snapped up. So there are actually relatively few MAM, independent MAM vendors nowadays. Um, and, and almost none that, that give you the option of running hybrid cloud or on-prem. Um, most, of, most of the new MAMs that have come out in the last couple of years have been pure cloud. And again, that works great uh, within, within limits. What most of our customers want is a hybrid cloud solution where they're basically uh, cataloging the material that's on-premise in addition to what's in the cloud. And uh, that, that's, that's been our focus. Um, so, so our AI engines and our collaborative editing can work with other people's MAMs. Um, but as you might imagine, you know, that hasn't been our primary focus so far. Um, and there aren't that many of them left <laughs> to collaborate with. Uh, it's been kind of, big. so a lot of folks have, uh, have kind of disappeared from the scene, even though the market is growing. So it's, it's, it's a good time for Axel AI just because we have essentially a, a big pool of potential customers um, and, and also many people that are converting from traditional MAMs like CatDV that are you know, looking for, for more modern solutions with more of this uh, collaborative focus. All right. Um, well, if there are no other questions, we could uh, wrap it up at this point, but again, going once, going twice, in, in case there are any 
Uh, any further questions before we uh, conclude? It looks like there's one, we'll say this is the last question uh, okay, in the chat. Great. Is there such a thing as a SAS ma'am? Yes, absolutely. Um, there, there are a number of them. Um, so actually, um, Axel Edit and, uh, and, and Axel AI are both available in SAS configurations, but there are also other companies like Mimir, um, like Iconic, uh, that, that offer uh, SAS configurations. And uh, yeah, if you just have a modest amount of footage, you can absolutely use uh, one of these tool sets, including ours. Um, and typically they're, you know, in the 50 to $100 per user per month range. But they're they're definitely out there. And, uh, um, you know, that that's more and more the trend. It's just that the nature of the MAM is that there's often a ton of footage. So it, that's where the cloud thing and, and that's where hybrid is the economics drive you you'd like to have your man in the cloud but you'd like to have your media on some place that isn't quite so expensive but uh, thanks everybody i mean it's actually really good questions and uh hope this has been beneficial and uh, nice comments coming in so it sounds like uh it's it's been uh, worthwhile uh but again